Allah wa barakatuh. Uh, Imam Abdul Ali Musa is born in USA and is born in Arkansas. And today he is the Imam of Masjid al Salam as well as he built another two masjids. One is in Oakland, California as well. He is uh, a member of the Institute for Contemporary Islamic Thought. Currently he is the guest of the IPCI and uh, Mr. Harun Kala from Pretoria and Rauf is hosting him for two days now, two programs. Today we went to the farm in Rauf and Imam said that he felt he connected with all the brothers that are there. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, alhamdulillah ahmaduhu wa stainuhu wa stadihi wa stagfiruhu wa umminu bihi jalla wa ala wa la akfuruhu wa ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu wa salahu bil huda wa din al all praise belongs to Allah. We praise Him, we seek His help, His assistance, and His guidance. We believe in Him and do not disbelieve in Him. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is His servant and messenger. Allah sent him that is Muhammad with Deen al Haq, the religion, the way, the methodology of truth. And this way of life known as Islam will rise to its proper position in this world, whether the mushriks like it or not. This is the promised land. God then laid it out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid it out. For you and I, it's a better condition in life, a higher state of being, right? But in order to reach that, there's some challenges that we have to face. In the case of Bani Israel, they had been enslaved under Pharaoh for 400 years, just like we as African Americans had, and they had developed an inferiority complex. They had developed uh, an idea of work, but they worked hard for somebody else. They worked hard for Pharaoh, isn't that right? And they didn't have the concept of doing anything particularly for themselves. So, this is why they had to wonder, but the key point in this is, is that when they looked at the people that inhabited the promised land, they saw themselves as insects, insignificant, unimportant, grasshoppers, as that book says, right? And then, since they saw themselves like that, when the other people there looked at them, they had the same reflection or vision of those people as they had of themselves. What that means to us is every time, like all of us face challenges in life, many of us are right now in the middle of a great transition, a great transformation. One of the main key elements in success in this trans transition is becoming the type of person I want to become you becoming the type of person you want to become. Just like right now, I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I'm exactly where I want to be. Because I believe that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trained me for. All the fitna that went before in life was on purpose for this purpose. That I went through drug dealing, and all the fitna of extreme wealth so that when I become a Muslim, Allah has pre-trained me to handle a job before I even knew I was gonna get it. Do you see what I mean? In other words, when Allah has something good for you, in fact, I have a hadith related to that. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu and who relates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, when Allah wants to favor a servant of his, 
He involves him in some misfortune in this world. And when he decrees evil for him, he gives him plenty of rope in this world, but would take him to task on the day of judgment. He also said only hard work brings high reward. And when Allah the exalted likes a people, he puts it under trial. Therefore, one who accepts and passes this trial gets Allah's pleasure for him and eludes the trial and his wrath. Most of us would think, uh, some people say, aren't you sorry that you was a drug dealer and that you did this, that, and the other? And uh, I said, no, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry at all. I said, whatever harm that I've caused in the past, I'm going to try to spend the rest of my life uh, relieving that uh, burden. But in the meantime, it was a training. You know, as a drug dealer, when I first retired, I was only 25 years old. The government entrapped me, and then entrapped me means that they set you up to continue drug dealing because they don't want you to retire uh, rich, successful, and black. They don't want you to do that. So when I was 25 years old, I was rich, I was successful. I said, I quit. I don't like this anymore. So then they entrapped me. When they entrapped me, a lot of changes happened. In entrapping me, uh, I finally left the country. I went to Algeria. I went to uh, many parts of Africa. I lived even in Tanzania. Dar es Salaam was a frontline state. That means that in those days, America, uh, uh, Africa was still half colonial, still under colonialism. Mozambique, Angola, all those places were still, and you, of course, were still under colonial or despotic rule. But I learned all about the African continent. I learned all about the Muslims here in, in Africa. I visited Europe and I studied all of what, how Europe existed and I could understand the different European approaches. Then I went to South America because I found that the brothers and sisters who were in exile from the United States didn't have any money. You know, the revolutionaries. So I said, well, I have a skill uh, selling drugs. So what I'll do now is I'll go to South America. I didn't know anything about South America. I went to South America, got all kind of connections, set up a, uh, a system of production and transportation, right, of cocaine from Colombia, Mexico, let it cool off a minute, and then from Mexico, send it into the United States. And I made plenty of money, and I would bring the money back to our brothers, African-American community, who was in different parts of Africa, but broke, and they couldn't carry on their struggle. After a while, I quit that. I said, wait a minute. I can't save 50 people and kill a 1,000. You know, in other words, I'm sending drugs into America, right, to help the struggle over here. We thought, well, we'll get organized in Africa and then we'll go back and take over America. You know, when you're young, you have the wildest dreams, but that was our, <laughs> that's the way we thought. It didn't happen, but we gave it a try. After a while, you know, over here, I was also studying the revolutionary philosophies, uh, selected works of German Mao Zedong, all the liberation ideas of those days. And it had an effect on me. So then I quit right at the middle of my career, not at the top of my career. No problems at all. Big houses in Colombia, all the police are paid off and you collaborate. In fact, if you, it's so corrupt in Colombia, if you're going to do a drug deal, you call F.A. Dos or uh, 
F2, or uh, the Edwana, the, the people who the customs, like Colombian FBI, to guard your deal. You say, we're gonna do a deal here around two o'clock this afternoon. We want some police to patrol the area to make sure nobody robs us. Yeah, that's the way you did deals down there. So the police, we worked hand in hand. In fact, they worked for us. Okay, so I quit right at the top of my career because of the effect of Islam. Islam, I'm also studying Islam. And I'm seeing true Islam here in Africa. I'm seeing an Islam not like what we was practicing in those days. In those days we practiced this, a kind of a counter-Christian Islam. Instead of the devil being black, the devil was white and God was black. It's kind of silly, but uh, that's what we thought. The black man was God and the white man was the devil. It's ridiculous, but that's what we practice. And I saw people over here practicing a different form of religion. They were oppressed by white society, but they didn't hate white people. And they didn't consider white people as bad, they considered the actions of Europeans as bad and detrimental, but it's not because of their color. So I began to look into this religion. Here's what I want to say. I found out that how we see ourselves will determine. I had a picture of life that was determined by my society. And they told me that, well, you can only do certain things. You can only be a criminal. You can only be a this. You can only be a that. And a lot of people today grow up and believe that, oh, I can only do certain things because society said, well, I'm too tall to do that, or I'm too short to do this. I'm too white to do that. I'm too black to do this, right? I'm too one thing or another, and this is what people have told us. But the blessing that I learned from all of that is not what other people say, it's not what other people think, it's not what other, uh, these systems. I was in a young, an institution when I was a youngster and the people told me, Reams, that was my slave name, you never be nothing. That's a terrible thing to tell a little kid. You'll never amount to nothing. Right? People tell all of us, you will never amount to nothing. Your life will be this, that, and other. What I'm saying to you tonight, no, that is not true. If we can form a different picture of ourselves, as we was talking today, the process we use is drawing a picture of what I want my life to be like, say 10 years from now. What type of house would you like to, to live in? What type of family would you like to have? How much education would you need to go back and get, right? How, how would you like to, uh, if we've caused our families, right, who love us and our friends uh, so much trial and strife, wouldn't we like to, because uh, if we're in jail, they're in jail with us, isn't that right? If our parents and our friends who, who love us and we begin to ruin our life, we're affecting their life too. Wouldn't you like that in five or 10 years, they would be proud and happy about you as a person? And you could go to your old friend that was trying to help you. Y'all probably got high a couple of times and he said, no, I'm sticking in school, I'm gonna do this. And we went on doing what we did, but he always loved us and hoped for us. Wouldn't you like to go back from him in two, three years and say, hey man, let's get out on a soccer field. I'm better than you, just like I was before. I'm clean, I'm straight, and I'm ready to go. And you go out just like it's when you was teenagers, right? Why? Because that's the ability that you have. When you straighten up your life, you don't just straighten up your life. Just like when you mess up your life, you don't just mess up your life, isn't that right? We mess up our mother's life, our father's life, our brother's and sister's life. 
people in our neighborhood who love us. Isn't that right? Now, we have the power right now to reaffect their whole life for the good. That's what we have. Allah then gave us that ability to improve and change our life and take pressure off everyone that loves us and actually make their life even better. This is called responsibility. We turn that, rule, that word around, not responsibility like they say, but the ability to respond. That means Allah have given us the ability to respond to our environment. And now in this transition period, I was talking to the brothers today and I was telling them, don't never let people tell you what you can't do because all of us were born winners. Everybody in here is a winner. And we ran the hardest race that we will ever run the most challenges and the most obstacles before we was even born. Now think about it. The sperm cell that's into the, the mother is traveling up the canal and it's not just one of you, it's millions of you. Millions of you, right? When I won the race, I was racing against a million other me's. And I won. You were racing against a million others. Who's gonna fertilize that egg? And you won. You'll never run a race against a million people again. You'll never face those kind of Allah gave you that ability before you even was conscious, right? That's why I say I'm not sad about what I did before because it was Allah's training and that Allah meant for that to be used at a later time in a proper way to help more people than it harm. So I believe that everything that I went through was for a reason. The Hadith confirms it about your situation and mine and all of us, that when Allah loves someone, he puts them through trial. The trial that we go through and addictions and whatever is one of the greatest trials a human being can have. It is difficult to stop using drugs. But if we have the courage and the backbone, we can beat it. So what if we relapse every now and then? That's all right. Human beings are always relapsing. I quit smoking and then I said, well, I just smoked one or two. Before you know it, I got packs of cigarettes stacked up in front of me, right? I go on a diet and lose 60 pounds and turn around and uh, you see me next year, I'm puffed all up like a balloon. What happened, brother? You were slim and trim. Well, I had a relapse. Don't all of us do it? On something or another, all of us have a relapse. So if you ever have a relapse, it ain't nothing. We say that a setback is nothing but a setup for a comeback. Now this sounds uh, challenging, but see, as African Americans in America, you always face one challenge or another. You can tell in the songs and everything, though, that we always facing a challenge. So a little backsliding, a little backup ain't nothing. That's why we say, a setback, right? A relapse, a nothing but a setup, placing, Allah is placing us in a different position so we can make a comeback. And this is the way life is. So we always have hope. Uh, it's, it has to be a hope that is uh, unrealistic almost. You know what I mean? It's, it's unjustifiable. It's uh, what they call audacious. That you're so hopeful that it's unreasonable. If you read our histories, they'll say it's unreasonable for you to be hopeful like that. If you read my history, it'll say it's unreasonable for you to be talking about good when you done did so much wrong. Well, it's not unreasonable, it's good. 
Because the things that I say to you, the brother was asking me what I meant the other day about Ilm al Yaqeen, Ain al Yaqeen, and Haq al Yaqeen. When Yaqeen is, I know this, what I'm telling you, because I know it. I, I, I know what I'm talking about, right? It could be come from research, it could come from study, and what have you, but I know what I know. The other thing is, I've seen it. I ain't al yakin I've seen it with my eyes. I've seen what drugs do to people. I've seen it with my own eyes. I was a dealer. I could tell what I sold something to somebody when they first started. I could tell them three months later, a year later. I know what it does. I've seen it with my own eyes. Ain al yakin Ain is the eye. Hak al yakin is you have experienced it. You touch the people. You feel the people, right? You may have tried some yourself once or twice and see how harmful it was. You know, you know I never dealt uh, heroin, although they tried to give me a, because once I was at one of my friend's house and he had some pure heroin, a big shipment, and I could smell it, and it made my flesh crawl. This is pure heroin. That's heroin that you could dilute about 20 times, and it would still be good. You could have one kilo, you could make uh, 20 kilos out of it, and it still knock your socks off. It was so powerful. I said in Jahiliya, I said, the devil is in that stuff. I knew it. Into, my intuition told me the devil is in that stuff. And I'm a drug dealer. And I know, I, I didn't say it was some mystical thing. I said in religious terms, the devil is in that stuff. Because it made my flesh crawl across the room. I'm way across the room. And I walk in the room and it made my flesh crawl. So, Hakkal Yakin is when you know by experience. I know fire is hot because I touched it. I know the life that you're going through or dealing with because I've seen it, smelt it, tasted it, touched it. I've been through it all my life. And I know that any life you choose for yourself with Allah's help is possible. That's where possibility thinking come in. That's where dreaming comes in. You know, you, you think this stuff is in books and people are lying. It's not true. Imagination should control your future, not your past. I was a this, I was a that. No, what does your imagination say? Don't you know that it's possible to to visualize, as I said, yourself being any, is, Islam is a becoming religion. That's why I'm talking about Islam in a different way. Islam to us means transformation. See, in the black community in America, nobody hardly hates Islam, no. That's in newspapers and in different neighborhoods. Because you know why? Everybody in our neighborhood, the black neighborhood, has a relative or a friend that's a Muslim. And they knew the person before, and then they knew him after. And they think of transformation. Transformation. So where, where is the root of our uh, real cure? The real cure comes when you don't want to have any drugs, when you don't need any drugs, right? When life gives you a better high than anything you could take into yourself. Like right now, I may not look like it, but I'm high as a kite just talking to you. I'm high as a kite remembering the sadness and the trauma that this thing caused people and Allah allowed me to get through it so I could come here to talk to you about it. So what I'm telling you is not the, I didn't study it in a book, although I read all about it, but I haven't. I'm telling you this because I know it works. Islam itself is a training system. Salah is a training system. 
to help you become a better person. If you can pray five times a day, it's cold in the morning and I went to bed late and I don't want to get up, but I do it five times a day, every day, whether it's hot outside, cold outside, rain, don't make no difference, right? I do it every day. That is discipline. That's self-control. That is you harnessing your nafs so that your nafs become a servant for good instead of a servant for evil. See, what happened to most of us, the shaitan gets to us and our nafs, our desires, our tastes, our wants uh, become under his spell and so our nafs, our desire to get drunk, to get high, to get all of that, right? That's our nafs speaking out. And shaitan get us hooked on our own nafs. And in fact, the Quran says that his nafs became his illa, his God. Little God, little G, right? And it brought him down and it don't make no difference to him whether you, he's like a dog, whether you throw a bone at him or you throw something at him or leave him alone, he still lulls out his tongue. That's when our nafs get hold to us. But now there's another side of nafs. Nafs can become a servant for good. Remember Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? In one case, a long story about Aisha radiallahu anha, and she asked him, because of what she had done, do, do I have a shaitan or Rasulullah? He says, yes. She's thinking, I'm the wife of the Prophet. How could I have? He said, even though, even thou Rasulullah, he says, yes, but I have conquered that shaitan, remember the hadith, and now he only suggests good to me. This is a process of transformation that we can go through also, is that our nafs become, can become a servant for good. That's what Ramadan is about, right? What is it about? It was for everybody, even those before, that you learned that tatakun is a word. What is that? Self-control, self-discipline, self-mastery. That your mind and your heart, your spirit, right, controls the flesh. The flesh will drag us down, isn't that right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to learn how to control and how to manage ourselves. If you want to change yourself, you can do it through all types of mechanisms and training. But the easiest and most direct way is learning how to manage and control ourselves. And how do we do that? We picture ourselves, if any of you ever played sports, right? Any ever, you remember? Whenever sports you played, sometime when you kicked that ball, you could tell it was going in, right? Now we play basketball and the, the strict rule in, in training is, is when you shoot, you follow the ball in, not only with your hand and your eyes and your whole body follows the ball in. You get so good, you can see, watch American basketball. Sometime the guy will shoot and turn around and go back. Why? Because he knows it's in. He can taste it, he can smell it, right? He knows in his whole being that that ball is going in. When I was a bodybuilder and a weightlifter as a young guy, I still work out, but uh, you can tell that after 68 years, you're not gonna be the same puffed up guy here and real little here and all of that. But when we used to lift real, real heavy weights, when you get up toward your maximum, you would have to sit on that bench a little while and think about it. It's kind of a little meditation. You know what you was doing? You was waiting till the point, we call it tasting it. You, I got it, I'm ready to go. Give me that weight. Because you can taste it. You, could, uh, you know you, what it is is you've seen it going up. I can get it and everything in your being is ready and you go down and you get it. That's why we talk about visualization. See yourself as a success. See, this period is only a temporary transition period. And Allah allowed you to slip into this only to make you a better person later on. Even think of yourself later on, how many people you can help, how many friends you got now that need the same help that you're getting right now. Think about it. 
So each one of you multiply yourself three or four times and you can almost cure the whole city. Isn't that right? That's how we have to think that Allah is helping us. This period that we're going through is only an educational, a transition period. We're moving from where we are to where we want to be. Now, where we want to be, that's determined by you. Do you understand what I, where you want to be is determined where you want to be and nobody can tell you. Remember, you can dream unrelentedly. Nobody can tell you what to dream or to visualize. People have doing this, been doing this for centuries. You know, they call it a storyboard. Have you ever noticed in, uh, in the pyramids, you see drawings of this king. He was a baby born and he grew up uh, training and fighting and he became the pharaoh or the leader and he won great battles and what have you. He married a beautiful queen and they had uh, a beautiful family and all of that. You see those they call a storyboard. You see them on the pyramids, right? And other ancient uh, temples, even in America. Now, most people think they drew those pictures uh, when the, the king or the pharaoh died. No, they drew those pictures when he was born. They drew those pictures when he was born. Why? So every time he look up, He'll see his life unfolding. Oh, I'm going to grow up to be a strong young pharaoh or a prince. And then I'm going to marry a beautiful princess. And I'm going to have many great wars and expand the empire and all of that. They drew that in the temples but when the guy is just born. He's just a baby laying there crying. It's a storyboard. It is whole life, and he believed it. Since he believed it, that's exactly the way it came out. Same way with us. Only thing is, we have the ability now to draw our own storyboard. Where do we want to go? This is the most valuable lesson. With Allah's help, dear believers, we can do and we can go anywhere we want to go. One of the main aspects of this is our attitude. Our attitude about where we are now. In the West they say attitude determines your altitude. Your attitude is how you, uh, is a position that you take. Your attitude is the way you're leaning. Uh, attitude is the way the plane is leaning or moving in accord with the horizon. So an attitude is a position. So if I take, put my hands up like this, I got an attitude. You know I'm ready to fight because like, this is my position. This is an attitude. An attitude is like Daoud. Daoud had an attitude. Everybody else looked at the giant and said, oh my goodness. This guy is too big to hit. My goodness, he's just a giant and he got, the Bible said he had six fingers and six toes. This is a big giant. He's covered everywhere. They gave uh, Daoud Saul's armor. Saul was a big guy. Remember in the Quran when it talks about Saul, they wanted a, a leader and he was strong and trusty. They said, we can't follow Saul because he he's not rich and what have you. He said, no, but he is strong and trusty. Same thing the Quran says about Musa, they said, oh. So they put Saul's armor on David. David probably weighs about 50 kilos soaking wet, you know. So the armor is so big it's dragging the ground. So he says, I'm taking this off because I don't know how to use this. But David took a sling. Why? Because he ran lions away from the flock. He did everything with the sling. So he took the weapon that he was familiar with. And when he faced Goliath, he had a totally different attitude. 
Everybody else said he's too big to hit. Daoud said he's too, uh, uh, he's too big to miss. I can't miss the guy, right? What do you mean he's too big to hit? He's too big to miss. I can't miss him. The simple thing is attitude. You see, he was leaning, his mind was leaning in a different direction. Therefore, the first thing, one of the first thing is our self-image, how we see ourselves. Visualize ourself and our family and our home, how we want to live 10 years from now. It, it is possible. You can do it five years. You could do it uh, for plan for the end of your life. This is what Allah has helped. Now, don't think that we got a magic crystal ball. You can rub it and everything. No. Everything depends on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But now, remember, we're using the prescription that Allah gave us. We're using our Islam. See, because this is the one that trains us to become what we want to be. So our attitude has so much to do with it. The next thing is optimism. We have a joke in the, in, uh, in the U.S. Between the optimist and the pessimist, the, twic the twixt the skull, the optimist sees the donut and the pessimist sees the hole. You know what they have. I guess they have donuts here too, right? Well, they have a... An op optimist is one that sees that big fluffy donut. And a pessimist sees it too, but he says, yes, there's a hole in it. Well, that's what it's supposed to have, but that's all because he's pessimistic. An optimist sees the world not only the way it is, but the way it can be. And, a, and an optimist believes that all the forces in the world will cooperate with that person if they use the right procedure, if they have the right belief system, if they do those things that are right and correct, that the whole universe, physical and ethical, moral and spiritual, will cooperate with them because they're in tune with Allah's creation and what Allah wants for his creation. See, Allah wants us to be a success. Allah didn't write on our forehead, oh, you're going to be a, oh, yeah, that's uh, Brother Abdullah. I want him to be a, a failure. So I'm just going to mess everything up for him. No. No, Allah didn't write that. Remember the hadith said that Allah put us in struggle, in strife, because Allah loves us. Do you know the more obstacles you face, the more, the better you become, the bigger you become. In the United States, our group has faced more fitna for a long period of time than anybody in U.S. history. There's nobody lasted over five or ten years, nobody. Since we're an anti-Zionist organization, we face CIA and FBI all the time, every day. 80% of the people in our organization are federal agents, 80%. 80%, and I only say that so that our signs sound sane, but in America we know that it's 90 or even 95. That's the way it is. We know our environment. Hak al yakin But we like it. If you saw some of our programs, we harass the FBI. I don't know if I brought them with. I have some programs here, how to punk the FBI. You know what we use in America if, if something is, is a punk or a sissy, right? That means the FBI is just a bunch of cowards. So I think here's one right here. Here's the program. It's called how to punk the FBI. Now, we go down to the FBI building. Before we go to the other Islamic centers and masajid, we pass it out to the FBI themselves. And we invite them to the program. And it's to make fun. We make fun of them. We make fun of the FBI. Nobody does that. The people think, man, Imam Musa done gone crazy. Now, I don't have any other the group go with me. I do it by myself. Everything else they help. 
but I do this myself because I'm prepared for anything that happened. Why would I do that? I do that because all the Muslims are afraid, especially after 9-11, of the FBI, of the internal forces, and they got spies and all that. This is true. So all the Muslims are afraid. So I say, well, if I call the FBI and make fun of them, and I go down there, if I don't get killed and I don't go to prison, it'll make everybody else feel less threatened. And that's exactly what happened. I didn't get killed. I'm not in prison. And I'm following the Sunnah. Can I read you one or two hadith relating to this issue? See, when, you, when Islam comes to you, the way it comes to us, we look in it and we find some solution for everything. Now, here's what the hadith says. Aisha radiallahu anha reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa kept a pulpit within the masjid for Hassan ibn Thabit. Now, if you know, Hassan ibn Thabit was a great poet of that time. That he might take his stand thereon and take pride in the Messenger of Allah or to meet oppression. She reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa used to say, satirize the Quraysh. That means make fun of them. And verily, it is more severe on them than throwing an arrow. This is in Sahih Muslim. The last hadith says, she also reported, I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Hassan, verily the Holy Spirit, that is Jibril, will not cease to help you so long as you meet opposition for the sake of Allah and his messenger. She said, I heard the messenger say, Allah, uh, say Hassan, satirize them. It will cure Muslims and it will also cure himself. This is also in Sahih Muslim. What does that mean? When you're fighting a big foe, they're fighting, of course, the Quraysh the biggest tribe in Arabia, the most well-organized and the wealthiest and the most powerful tribe. They are a small group of people just going into exile, right? And so most of the people will have a fearful attitude about them. So the prophet, peace be upon, had a, a member in the masjid, especially for Hassan ibn Thabit, the greatest poet of that time. And he said, make fun of them, satirize the Quraysh. And basically it's saying, if you satirize them, the holy, the, the Jibril, the Holy Spirit will guard and protect you as long as it's in the way of Allah. Not for building yourself up saying I'm a great poet. That Allah will protect you and if you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying it will cure the Muslims and it will cure Hassan. So this right here, I'll have to explain a little and then I'll, I'll leave it alone. But this is making fun of the FBI. So I said, how interrogate the interrogator and instead of uh, them interrogating you, you interrogate them, right? Then it says, Three Stooges rule. This is another joke, Three Stooges. Do you guys remember the Three Stooges a long time ago? Well, that's what we call George Bush. We call him George Failure to Bush. George the Third, we call him. You know, King George the Third that the colonies fought against to gain their freedom, uh, two, three hundred years, 250 years ago. So we used to call George Bush, King George. And then we used to call this lady Anja Mama Rice. I don't know if you know who Anja Mama is, the lady on the pancake. So Anja Mama is kind of like uh, old, uh, anyway. So this woman, Miss Rice, was the Secretary of State at that time, Condoleezza Rice. 
So we was making fun of her. Then we called this other guy, Lon Chaney. Lon Chaney, remember all those horror movies? I guess I have to talk on this side, all the old horror movies. Lon Chaney, the man of a thousand faces, the werewolf and all of that, that was Lon Chaney. So we call him Dick Chaney, Lon Chaney. So we have a, a program called Counter Demotivational Therapy. And it's called the denegroization process. That's too long for me to, uh, to explain. But the Negro, denegroization process is taking out the Negro. The Negro is the old African American that they made us who he was. And we have to have a process to take that out. Let me finish up. How to disregard the FBI authority without going to jail. How to bring the sissy out of your local FBI agent. Counter harassment techniques. Here's the first one. Did your mama buy that shirt? Okay, now remember our mother, when we go shopping, we want to buy the latest fashion, right? You know, that costs three times as much as a good shirt. We want to buy that cheap shirt that what everybody else is in style. But our mother buys that good shirt that only costs a few rands, right? And we want to buy the cheap shirt that looks good for a hundred rand. So when you go to school, everybody know, they used to tease each other, they would know, hey man, did your mama buy that shirt? They know your mother bought the shirt because you wouldn't have. So we tell, first thing when the FBI come in and sit down, we ask them, hey man, did your mama buy that shirt? <laughs> you know, it's simple, but it's harassing him. It's throwing, he's used to being the man in charge. Oh, I'm from the FBI, here's my thing, and uh, by the way, I wanna know this, that, another. And you stop him in his track before you even get out here, some man, did, you get the, did your mama buy that shirt for you? You know, and then, so now he's feeling stupid and small. So you're in charge, you're taking charge of the whole interview. Instead of being a victim of them, it's simple, it's just harassment, that's all. It's making fun of them. So, if you have a big powerful enemy and you count up, well, they have 2,000 atomic bombs, they have three million soldiers, and they all have high tech helmets and push button gadgets. And we only have three old rifles and uh, we're barefooted. Therefore, they're automatically gonna win, isn't that right? But we go out and we make fun of them. All them old phony gadgets you got ain't nothing. Look at my latest, this is the latest, this old weapon I got is only 200 years old. So it's going to work so good that it's going to overpower your high tech. Because this is so old that your high tech can't touch it. Because it's so old. Your stuff is so new it don't even know what this thing will do. <laughs> You're just having fun. You're making fun of your enemy. So the Muslims are so afraid of the system, the FBI, that I said, if I go down and make fun of them publicly, see I pass this out at the FBI building first, then I pass it out at all the massages. So everybody's watching. Imam Musa's program is on Saturday, June the 2nd. If he's around on June the 3rd, hey man, it's all right. So it comes up, I didn't get killed, I didn't go to jail, nothing happened. And we made fun of them. It made the Muslims feel better. In other words, we live in a society where we have to use what Allah gives us. We don't have an army to stop those people. But we have in our arsenal something called, it's called kindness. We're going to fight the system, not with what they did to us, but we're going to return like the Quran with kindness. So we have kindness, we have something else. We have humor. On here it says how to laugh your enemy to death. You know what I mean? 
I'm saying a lot gay, okay, you know, you like all African-American comedians and speakers, right? This is a gift a lot gave us, so I'm gonna use that. I'm not gonna use it to make money making jokes. I'm gonna use it uh, dealing with our enemy. And it works. That's what psychological guerrilla warfare is. A lot give you something. Each person in here, a lot have given certain special gifts. We have to study ourselves. What gift did Allah give us to use in not only transforming myself, but this transformation is not only for me as an individual. Remember, I owe a lot of people. I want to help transform their lives. And then I may have little brothers, little cousins, people who headed in the wrong direction. If I can make it, they can make it. Isn't that right? Just think of all the good you can do. One person in this room becomes a success. That means as another five or 10 people down the line, automatically, that improves and that, that, that wins off of your individual success. That's related to community. So dear believers, what we have to say tonight is, Look at your situation with optimism and ignore the facts. What do I mean by ignore the facts? When we were young, they would tell us, well, you would say, I want to be a pilot. People would say, white folks ain't going to let you fly no airplanes. We said it automatically. We didn't think about it. Well, I want to go to Hollywood and be in the movies. White folks ain't going to let you be in the movies unless you're just sweeping up a, a maid or something like that, or the butler. Everything we wanted to do, we would consider the system first. We would automatically say, white people ain't going to let you do that. You see? Therefore, we were allowing others we considered up. They wasn't doing, they wasn't standing there in our front door stopping us from studying and working and becoming. The system was against us, right? But if we worked hard enough, studied hard enough, we could make it. But we considered, oh, they won't like it. So therefore, I'm finished before I get started. We said no, because the shaitan will come and tell you all the time. He will bring you facts. Those facts will be right. Well, for us, well, you're black. So if you're white, you're all right. If you're yellow, you're mellow. If you're brown, stick around. But if you're black, get back. Those are sayings I've said it many times. That's a saying that we had amongst our own people. We had songs about it. If you're white, you're all right. Everything's fine. If you're yellow, that means mixed black and white, kind of yellow, maybe with straight hair, you're all right. If you're brown, well, you won't win a medal, but stick around. But if you're black, get back. That's what we said to each other. And we believe that. Don't you, imagine, don't you see how ignorant we were as a people? That we actually said those things. We considered everything else the system said before we considered our own person, our own ability, and we allowed them to shape and form our life. And I can go to Sri Lanka, to Pakistan, all over Europe, South America, and everywhere talking about Islam and the people telling me what I can't do having never been out of the city of Washington, D.C. They're telling me facts about what's gonna hold me back. And I'm right here with you in South Africa and they don't even know where South Africa is on the map. But they were telling me facts. You, you're a jailbird, man. You've been to prison since you was a little kid. Going in and out of jail. You deal drugs, man. You ain't gonna be nothing. You can't do nothing. They're wrong. Why? Because we don't let the facts get in the way. This is what I'm saying to you. Don't let the facts get in the way. I was using, I was this, I was that. So what? That's a fact. 
But that was a past fact. That don't have nothing to do with the future. Our future is determined by what we do from here on out. And remember, you have the greatest transformational force in history, that is Islam. That's why in the black community in America, Islam is important because people who were drug addicts, women who were uh, prostitutes, became great mothers, great family people. In fact, we don't hold nothing against nobody. Like for instance, if I want to get married right now and a girl became Muslim and she was a prostitute, that wouldn't have nothing to do with it. A lot of people would say, oh, she was there. I would say, hey, that don't have nothing to do with it. One, well, she has a lot of experience, that's all. <laughs> right? But how could I say I was a drug dealer? How could I say, oh, you are a prostitute. You, uh, mm, I ain't going to marry you. Right? It would be insane. It would be letting our past make a, a prisoner to our future. The past is back where it belongs. Right now, and I'll move toward a close. Right now, visualize the life you want to live. The only reason I say it's possible because I know personally it's possible. I know personally that this visualization works even before you even know it. And I'm gonna give you two examples. The reason I became a drug dealer because in 1961, I guess I was about 16, 17. I was watching a, a television program. It was a new pilot program. It was called Untouchables. It was about Al Capone. Al Capone was a great Chicago Italian gangster. And I saw that and I liked it. And I looked at Al Capone with these big cars, pinstripe suits, a big gangster organization. And I said in the back of my mind, I like that. That means that Hollywood had made a role model for me before I even knew, before I even formed a natural. So Martin Luther King was not a role model. No, later on Malcolm X and these people became, but not then. So I said to myself, if I were to live during prohibition, that's in the 1920s when alcohol was prohibited in America and they produced all of these gangsters that you see on the movies. So I said, if I would have lived during the 1920s, I would have been a gangster. Then I got lucky and went to prison, little young prison. Then I came home in 1965 the world was changing. I left in 62, it was like the Stone Age. In 65, white kids was walking all throughout the neighborhood with flowers in their hair, you know, we called them hippies. And every, the world was, I said, what are y'all doing here? I said, well, I'm doing everything my mother told me not to do. And the people told them, don't be around those niggas. And the kids knew their parents was lying to them, so they went right to us. And think about American culture. The music, everything that white kids like is black culture. It is. Think about it. All the music, all the slang is cool, it's this and that. It's black culture. So, but something else had happened. Now people were smoking a lot of marijuana and stuff like that. So I used to take guys, Carlos, the guys over to San Francisco to what we call the temple. This is the nation of Islam. And they were smoking weed and everything. And uh, I didn't smoke weed because I was in the nation of Islam. So, but I was getting a contact high. You know what a contact high is? As they smoking weed in the car, you got the windows rolled up, you getting as high as they are, <laughs> right? So. Finally, I asked them, well, how much does that stuff cost? Well, you buy this much uh, for $50 and you can make $150 and that. I said, is that right? So I had a good job, but finally, this old fitna from years ago snapped in my mind. Hey, if I would have lived during prohibition, I would have been a gangster. 
This is prohibition, but now it's marijuana, it's drugs. That is the thing that's prohibited. So I started selling drugs. Why? Because of subliminal suggestion. They had put a picture in my mind of success, and guess what? That picture worked. I became that physical success, exactly the picture that I had of the gangster Al Capone with the big car, the beautiful clothes. I became exactly that. I may even have one or two pictures here. Let me see. I became exactly that. This is the kind of car, one of the cars I used to drive. This car has mink in it. You know, the, the mink that people, women wear. This car got mink in it. And it's special made and everything. Very expensive. And this is the way I used to dress. You could buy a house with how much that suit costs. That suit in those days cost about $10,000 because this is mink. Now $10,000 is like $100,000 now. And, but that was the vision. I saw it on TV. I saw Al Capone, rich guy, you know. And so that picture that I formed in my mind is what I became. Later on, I took a real role model, and that role model was Malcolm X, Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz. The same transition he went through, the Nation of Islam, da 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 I did the same thing. He traveled all around the world and met people all over the world. I do exactly the same thing. He gave motivational speeches to help people improve and get better. I do the same thing. I became just like my role model. So you have a good role model, you pick a good role model, and you move in the same direction. Now, we have to move even above the Malcolm X role model. Why is that? It's because today it is not saving the race or the region. We got to make a better world, a whole new world. If we don't improve, if we don't rise to the occasion of our time, this system, these systems won't destroy uh, uh, this country or that country. They're destroying the whole world. There's hardly no more fresh air left, right? There's smoke all over the world. Even they're polluting the oceans. Do you know that these people have almost fished up the ocean? Can you imagine? Over 75% of the planet is water. The, the Pacific Ocean is 68 million square miles, and the Japanese and others have almost fished up the ocean. Can you imagine? What it means is that we have to become a bigger, greater people, not only for our friends and our family, but for the whole world. We have to actually rescue the earth from these people, of what we have to do. Not from colonialism, not from racism, but from the human being. We have to develop a non-predatory global system, a non-predatory communal system, a system of cooperation between humans of all races and colors, right? that will at least give the earth a 20-year rest where it can cleanse itself, and, right? It will replenish itself if it's given a little time. We live in a very critical time. As far as Islam is concerned, you cannot read a newspaper, you can't turn on a television without Islam or Muslims being on the front page every day all over the world. That mean, we're living in a special time. That time before of colonialism and civil rights and decolonization and the period you went here through getting rid of apartheid and what have you, we have to develop a whole new system of living. Why? Because think about it, ask anybody. Is this what we thought post-apartheid would be like? 
<laughs> Can you imagine the great, I came here right after the election in 94, the great hopes and dreams and aspirations of the people. Now, in some cities, especially the, the richer ones like uh, Lodium and those places like that, everybody living like they're in prison. They have all the gadgets and locks. This is right after apartheid. Everybody had, I said, what is going on, what are y'all doing? Well, we got to lock up, and then when everybody's going to bed, they, they close this window, that window. Then they have a, a gate, like a prison gate, to separate one part of the house from the other. I said, man alive, all this money you guys having? When you go to Juma and Lodium, it's more Benzes and BMWs than anywhere in the world. Everybody knows that, right? And they're living in prison. I said, is this the South Africa you wanted? Nope. I said, well, then you, as Muslims, got to change it. The Boers are not going to fix it. Black people have not had enough experience with management, with organization and structure to do it. I say, you guys got to do it. So why us? I say, because you're right in the middle. You're right in the middle. And if you don't do it, you're going to find they're going to blame everything on you. They're going to rob you. They're going to say this and that. And the next generation of A and C that don't remember how you helped doing apartheid will be setting you up and doing everything. I say, you have to. You have to go up and challenge this great society. The Israelis and all of those people who control big business, you have to challenge them. And guess what? The Muslim community have a foundation to start with. We have expertise in all areas, right? Tell the truth. So we have to reach up, but we also have to reach back and bring the African up and help teach and train him and be able to withstand an 80% failure rate. 80% failure rate. Because if you try to help 10 brothers, soon as you leave the store or the shop, and you say, now you're supposed to save the money. See, uh, in the old days, Indians wasn't going to waste no money. He is not going to buy a big fancy wheel car and all that, right? He's going to buy a little bitty car and just stack that money up. Isn't that right? You have to teach that to African because the first thing the African is going to do is the first thing we would do in the U.S. As soon as we get a little money, forget reapplying, resupplying the store. I need a new car, a big car. Now you got to pay the car note and you don't want to have but one bowl of oatmeal or one package of chips in the store. The money that you bought the bins with was supposed to restock your store. But our brothers without training, this is natural. This is not saying, this is all our people all over the world. See, it's different if you are at the bottom in your own country, the land that belonged to you, you hurt most by it. You know, most, and I'll close in a minute. Native Americans are very honorable people. They kept all the treaties, but they took all the land from them, put them on reservations, like put our brothers here in townships and homelands, <laughs> all those beautiful names. They put Palestinians in, or in refugee camps, isn't that right? They put us in ghettos, same thing. All of us confined to a certain area, reserves, reservations, homelands, they're all the same. So we didn't come up with experience in management, organization, and all of those trainings. I was a lucky one. I, I actually feel, as an African-American, very lucky because I had management skills from day one. But all my friends, they didn't have management skills. Some of them made as much money as, as I did, and they, I don't know where it went. I thought they went home and burned it all night because I didn't know where it went. They, I said, what do you do? Do you have a fireplace in your house? 
No, I mean, I know the business they did. We're in the same business. They did a big turnover. I don't know where they spent that money, but it's not me. It's all of our people. You ever see these multi-million dollar basketball players, baseball players? What happened to them after they finished playing? They all broke. Why none of them use the money? Why none of them? Because we've never been trained to. That's global. The people at the bottom, they strip their culture, their language, and so they're out of place in their own home. An Indian, uh, an Indian uh, owned the land, but he had a different culture. He fit into it perfectly. Now he's in an alien culture in his own land. So what are you gonna have on reservations? Alcoholism, drug abuse. Why? Because in a great war, it affects the men more than anybody because they feel like they lost. We lost, and look at our wives and children. We didn't win the battle. How are they gonna win the battle with all those Maxim guns and supersonic weapons in those days, right? Against bow and arrows. It's just like it they did here in Africa. They come in in the colonial period with Maxim guns shooting at people right, with machine guns, with leopard skin shields and spears. You're gonna slaughter everybody, right? But they're still gonna feel I, I lost. So the men are gonna be more prone to drug abuse and alcoholism. That's natural. Management of society, they brought in a European system here. It's a European system, right? So you've learned that system well. So now you have to move up, and I'm not saying take it from those people who have it, but you have the ability, you have the base, and you have the skill. And then you have to bring up the majority community with you. If you don't, they're gonna steal and take everything from you anyway. You're gonna live a miserable life, tell the truth. This is not the South Africa that everybody hoped for, is it? Maybe I'm wrong. This is not the South Africa that all of us, remember we was with you over there, we was against apartheid, we demonstrated. We, so our hopes and dreams was your hopes and dreams. We know this is not what you wanted. But Allah said, Allah will not change the condition of a people till they change themselves. And fusihim, that means within themselves, their own soul, their own mind, their own spirit. That's all we're saying tonight, dear brothers and sisters. We can change the world in which we live in. The world technically is waiting on us. And I want to close with last, one last thing. That There's a lot of things that people don't pay attention to. Allah will help you from ways and avenues that you never even thought of. Just like all this that goes on here. Nobody had a pocket full of money, right? They just got moving, and all of a sudden, uh, things begin to happen. That's because of tawakkul, trust in Allah. And you do good deeds, and Allah will help you. We're telling the Muslims, the young Muslims, especially the immigrant community, to make more movies and do more halal poetry and things, and just put it on DVD, and pass it out to the Muslims. They say, why? I said, because you develop a culture of your own. They said, what's so, what's so important about that? I said, the, my, the majority culture, in most cases, the youth adopt the culture of the oppressed in music and everything else, right? White people, the white kids adopted our culture. The language, the culture, all of that stuff you see in the US now is all from us, the whole culture. And you driving down the street for the last decades and you hear hoop, boop, de bop, doop, boop, and this is white kids. What are they doing listening to all of that stuff? They listen and they spend more money on rap and hip hop than blacks do. If our Muslims begin to produce and put out their own cultural 
how they relate to society, the majority culture in five and 10 years will adopt their culture. They don't know it because they're not old enough to remember. That's why it's good to get old because you remember certain patterns. The, the majority culture will adopt the minority culture almost every time, the kids, because what they do, their family do, their parents do is not cool, right? But what they do is cool. Do you hear what they say? You see the moves they make? That's cool. What our parents do ain't cool, right? Now, we develop our own culture and put it out and the people will adopt our culture and the next generation. And I'll close with this. I don't know about South Africa, but all the fitna in the US, Islam is exploding. If you want to run an American to something, you tell them, stay away from it. Just like our kids, stay away from those kids up the street. They're bad kids. They'll go right around through the backyard. And next time you see them, they're playing with the exact kids, right? That you told them to stay away from. They're telling the white kids, the Americans, Islam is bad. Well, America, everything that's bad actually means good. When we say that's a good person, we say that's a bad dude, yeah, that's a bad brother. That means he's good, strong, good character. We say he's bad. So bad means good. They say, stay away from that Islam. It's bad. The kids say, hey, let me go see what this Quran said. The biggest, one of the biggest selling books in America is the Quran. And Islam is exploding in America. Why? Because they're telling everybody Islam is bad. Stay away from it. And the way you get an American to stay away from something is tell them to go to it. And the way to get them to go to it is tell them to stay away from it. This is part of the culture. People don't realize it, but that's the way things happen. So actuality, Islam is spreading in America with all the fitna, with all the Islamophobia, <laughs> with everything that's going on there. So I just want you to remember that anything Allah does to us is for our benefit. Whatever transition you're going through is for your benefit to make you a stronger, a better person. Anybody that goes through the transitions that we have comes out on the other end a better human product. That person feels more for other people, understands people more, and has more empathy for those who are oppressed and downtrodden. So actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done you a favor. And remember dear believers, everybody here is a winner. Never let anybody tell you you're a loser. You are a born winner and you have all the abilities and all the capabilities that it takes to make you become who you want to become. Remember, you can choose the type of person you want to be. And I'll close with this for the fourth time. In bodybuilding, I used to do a lot of bodybuilding. I still work out. This is where I was when I was a young guy. I was buff, big. Swole all up. You know what? Bodybuilding, there's exercises to build up every part of the body. You want your chest to be big? Some guys had chest so big, you could set a cup full of water on it and it wouldn't spill over. I'm not like that now, but that's the way it was in those days. You could choose whatever part of your body you wanted to develop. There's a particular exercise for that body part. Okay, now you can build bodies, you can build communities, right? You can build minds, you can work on your heart the same way there's a, a exercise, even for your heart. Doesn't the Quran say there's a polish for everything? And everything rusts. And the polish for the heart is what? The dhikr of Allah. That means that Allah then created something to build up the heart. I'm not talking about the pumping heart, muscle, but 
the intellect, the internal spiritual mechanism, that special place in the human being reserved for Allah, it can be improved by contact with the one who created that special space, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? We got everything going our way. So there's a special exercise for everything and for everybody. We can build our bodies. We can also build our hearts. We can build our minds and we can build our community and we can build a better world. It's how we visualize it. I'll start with the same way that I, uh, I'll finish the same way I started. Develop a better picture of yourself. It's called self-image psychology. How I see myself, not what they told you, not what anybody told us, but how you want to be. And I'm only telling you that because for me, it worked like a charm. It worked when I didn't even know what I was doing. I read books on visualization and all that. But in 1968, I was, uh, I had a, a, a picture. I was kind of semi-retirement for a minute with a lot of problems from the government. So I was smoking a little weed. I don't, you know, shouldn't do that. And then I was listening to certain <laughs> music. And I was visualizing big, long, pretty limousines and businesses and everything. I was just picturing it, how it would look. Six months later, all that was true. Six months later, all that was true. It happened. I didn't know they even called it visualization. <laughs> I didn't even know what it, but it was working. When I studied later, I found all of these concepts. This is visualization. I thought it was, hey man, I just thought of something real nice and that would be on the Money, since I pictured that, I did everything that it took to do it. And I'm here right now because this is where I want to be and I don't want to be nowhere else. What I'm doing is what I want to be, what I want to do. Everybody can choose what they want to do. And what they, Allah allows you. Allah don't say, you got to go to school and be a mechanic. You have to be a doctor. You have, Allah don't say that, right? Allah allow you the choice to choose your own profession. Just like Allah choose, allow you the choice to choose your own family and your own future. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us improve and make this transition period of great value. It, I mean, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you to Brother Ali Musa for that inspiring message that he has given us. Uh, just a few comments before I take questions and answers from the floor. Uh, the idea of developing a, a, a positive image, uh, the sky is the limit if we have a positive image. Never ever assume that, 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 that any human being cannot aspire to a higher level. All of us have got that ability. It's just that we do not exercise that option to the maximum. One of the things that the Prophet ﷺ used to recite in the early parts of the morning was a verse from the Quran, Surah Al-Imran, which reads, verily in the creation of the heavens and the earth, in the alternation of the day and the night, there are signs for men of understanding. This is a, a very profound and high level of thinking that is being encouraged. Because if we get up in the morning, what do we normally think about? I've got the rent to pay, I've got this problem, I'm down here, down here. We're not thinking big. We seem to sort of being sitting in a zone and we sort of cluttering our brains up with, 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 with small things. Whereas the, 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 the the instruction that, or the lesson that we are learning from the, from, the, from the Prophet is to say, when you get up in the morning, it's a new day that Allah has blessed you with, and you need to think big, bigger than what you can, and dream big. And just as the Imam has said, then within six months, the dream that he had seen and the visualization that he had done became a reality. 
like that every one of us has that potential. Now I leave the floor open for any questions or comments uh, that you would like to make or raise any points that the Imam would also would like to uh, respond to. Imam, I just wanted to know, um, like, what was your turning point? What made you decide to, you know, now I had enough. I, I want to make a change in my life. I want to stop selling drugs, stop doing drugs, stop messing up people's lives. Well, this was a long process, and it was a process of, a, of transition, maybe about a five-year period, because all the time that I was doing what I was doing in the later years, I was in a process of evolving out of it. Uh, that's why I said at one time I had retired. When I was 25, I was very rich. I hadn't hurt anybody. I didn't do anything to anybody except uh, uh, the people that maybe died from drugs or what have you, but not personally. So I basically retired at 25. Then the system came back and uh, we call it entrapment. That's when they give you, uh, they give you an offer you can't refuse. Like the best drugs at the best price. You know, connections in Mexico. They actually took me down to Mexico and I went, you ever heard of Sinaloa cartel? They took me to the state of Sinaloa. Sinaloa has a city there called Cuyacan. It is the drug capital of, of the Americas. Everything is either produced in Sinaloa and other states in Mexico, or it comes from South America to Sinaloa. And then when I was taken to Sinaloa, they took me to the attorney general's office. That's like, uh, I don't know, what the great minister, whoever the second in charge is, the governor, or whatever you call of this area. They took me to his office. This is our brother here, he's all right. And I'm gonna do business there from now on. I never had a problem at all because they took me directly to the center of all the traffic. But, after that arrangement, they will set me up so they could give me a case later on. I'm glad they set me up. I'm glad they gave me a case. If I wouldn't have got a case, I would have went into exile. Allah know what I would have. I would have either uh, continued later on to do the same thing. Something else would have happened. This wouldn't have happened. Okay, when I begin to travel around the world, I begin to study about a bigger world than uh, Oakland, California, about colonialism, about the human condition. And when I lived in South America, I saw the human condition and the African condition. So it's having an effect. The final big effect was, I would say, 1973, when I had seen most of the world. And uh, as I say, I was at the top of my career. And I said, I quit. But I quit mean that I have to go to the United States, turn myself in, and fight my case in court. Of course, I thought I was going to win. I didn't. I went to prison. But while I was in prison, I had the most wonderful experience that I evolved from that one type of Islam to true Islam. And I had the opportunity to study Quran and Hadith for several years without no interference at all. And uh, at another time, when I became the Imam in prison, I learned all of what I needed to learn. So when I came out, the first thing I did was open the masjid. I had a little money left. Now remember, the money, if I earned money now from dealing drugs, it would be haram to do a masjid or something. But the money that I had from Jahiliya, when I took Shahada, my money took Shahada with me. Right? Am I right that what I did before, Umar's wealth was halal. He might have earned it a different way when he took Shahada. So when I took Shahada, 
with all of that, what I did before, what I had left over, I uh, opened a masjid in Oakland. And it helped me do so, a lot of things. So uh, I would say the big transition was in 1973 when I just had enough. I saw that drugs was controlled by governments and they're controlled to manage people's life, to bring societies down like drugs here in South Africa to make sure that South Africa never use all the potential of people and resources. Because if it did, it would be an example to the rest of Africa. You know, South Africa is the most, not only affluent, but it's the most mechanized you have better schools, better roads, and all that than anywhere else on this continent. So if South Africa improves to the point that it can't, it can be an example. And this could spread all over Africa, from South Africa. So the West, when you first became liberated, the first thing they did was took the atomic bomb away, right? First thing. Then after that, AIDS and drugs became prevalent here. It wasn't because of loose borders, it's because they brought them here. This is my opinion. They brought them here. Because no, no people can improve as long as drugs permeate the society. Why did I know that? because the black movement was in rebellion in the 60s and they used drugs to break the back of the movement. Just like Britain started the opium war against China to break the back of China, it is a national policy of oppression. So I made my big move in 1973, came back and went to a U.S. penitentiary there for a while. Not too long, just three and a half, four years. It wasn't no time. For all of what I had done, it was a rest period. <laughs> I got a chance to study Quran and Hadith. It was a rest. Prison never did me any harm. It always did me good. And, and, and you know why I think that? Because I looked at life and every time, it, it's like a cartoon. The characters walking down the street and a refrigerator is falling out of a 10-story building on him and somebody call him, he stop and turn around and the refrigerator crash, crash right by him and miss him. That's been happening all of my life. And I feel blessed because all of those brothers that were, we were together in these little children's prisons years ago, they became the forefront of the black movement and the system killed almost every one of them. The other ones that ran crazy. So I have a mission. My mission, they didn't even get a chance to hear about true Islam. So I have to do not only my work, but I have to do what I imagine they work because they had became, they had changed from criminals to revolutionaries and the system finished them off. And I escaped I lived through more plots and schemes than any movie I've ever seen. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> Two assassination attempts in 1970. That's why I said, okay, if you guys are trying to finish the whole story, I'm leaving. That's why I really left America, because after two assassination attempts, and you know what saved my life? And one of them, it was this big, pretty car because the police had taken me, taken me out of my car and taken me around the park and they was ready to shoot me. And I was known for that big, beautiful car. It was my neighborhood, everybody knew me. So when they saw the cars with the top open and the doors open, they knew something was wrong. So everybody went around looking for Big Hank because I was a neighborhood drug dealer. Plus, I bought people Cadillacs and stuff like that. You know, I didn't want to be in heaven by myself since I was rich, <laughs> right? No, that's the way Allah made me. I, didn't, I said, hey, I'm rich, and I see one of my friends walking down the street, 
In those days, a Cadillac was like a Benz or BMW, the big ones, not the little ones. So I'd see one of my friends, I said, man, look like you're doing pretty bad. Let's go down to the car dealer. I'd go down to the car, I said, pick one of them boys out. And I'd pull the money out and pay for it cash. And he'd be happy because in those days, a car is what made us happy. So anyway, I made a, it was a long transition, brother, one period after another. It wasn't one point, but if I would say the real turning point was 1973, when I had traveled all over the world and I had seen that this was corruption, this was a plot to kill us, and it was working, and it was happening not only in America, but all over the world, and I said, I quit. And so I would say, but still it's an evolutionary process. If you think it's hard to stop using drugs, stop trying to sell drugs when you're, when you're successful at it, right? Stop trying to, because drugs, you see all the big drug dealers are all powerful. They have beautiful cars, beautiful women, they have everything. And people listen to what they say, right? So you have power, wealth, and beauty. You have everything that Jahiliya says is great. Now, you want to stop and set all of that aside for a great idea. That's difficult. That's very difficult. It's harder to stop selling drugs when you're successful than it is to stop using them. Are there any more questions? I hope I halfway answered. Thank you. When you're coming up the ladder in drug dealing, the system identifies you. The government identifies you. And they give you a connection. That's what happened to me. When I was moving up the ladder and I became uh, in pocket, as they say, I became in place, then the government I'm telling you, government controlled drugs. They, I didn't know it then, but they came and they gave me my connections. The perfect connections, good price, good quality, and then I move up the ladder and I take over. And they do that and I stay in power until I've gotten so powerful and so wealthy, now they put me out and bring in somebody else. They do it all over the world. This is a system, okay? The Colombian cartels that you've heard about. Well, I used to live in Colombia during the early days, and all those people that you hear about, like Pablo Escobar, I used to live in Medellin. We was all young guys together and he became the greatest drug exporter probably in world history. He was on the way up. But he made a mistake. He, he, he uh, wanted to do good, so he uh, joined uh, the Congress and he won a place in Congress, and so now he's a threat. He's super rich and He's made a transition. Pablo Escobar in Colombia, he would build, let's say, 500 houses. And he would go to the dump in the places where the homeless people are, and he would give them the keys to a brand spanking new apartment that belongs to them. You don't know that about Pablo Escobar, the, the so-called Colombian drug. That's why he was killed because he made a transformation, because he was a murderer too. He wasn't that nice, I mean, he, you know, because the business don't allow you to be too sweet too long. And then they got rid of him. Why can they get rid of every cartel and every so-called drug kingpin? Is because they set them up like they did me in business after you get so big and then they have you on a schedule, and after they get tired of you, they move you aside and bring somebody else in. That's the way the system works. The cartels are the same way. 
when they get so big, the government sends them lawyers, financial managers, and everything. And they help them export their money, hide their money, and they teach them how to manage all of this thing. And they teach them, well, you don't have to count your money. Just take a box and weigh it, put in $100 bills till it get to be 63 pounds, and that's, a, that's a, so many million dollars. Bop! And that's what you do. You don't even have to count it. There's so much money. A count machine, you would go crazy counting all that drug money that they make nowadays. What happened in Mexico? The power of drugs transferred from Colombia to Mexico. Remember I said Mexico is the transit point. So the Mexican organizations became the most important because the drugs is produced in Colombia plus the heroin and marijuana that's produced in Mexico combined to make the Mexican cartels the strongest. Now, how can we have these people making all of these billions of dollars but make sure they don't get to use any of it for good? That's the main purpose. In each organization, there is some petty chiefs. What do they do? They start problems with the other. You know the British thing, divide, conquer, and rule? So all of a sudden, the Mexican cartels did something a few years ago that they never did before. Wholesale slaughter. That's a United States government policy. Caused them to fight each other. So they waste all their resources. With all that coming, money coming to Mexico, it can build up Mexican industry so much that it can challenge U.S. power of production. The money is overwhelming. You've read the newspapers. Where do the guns for this uh, Mexican cartel war come from? From the United States. From the United States government. Why would that happen? To keep them fighting each other. That's why anywhere in the world, if we ever start moving toward progress, they go to this tribe and tell them, oh, this, that, and other. For us, they'll say, this madhab is no good. You got to stop. They do one thing wrong. They don't make salat with their kufi on or anything, right? So they're no good, right? Tell the truth. They do that to us. And right now, you look in the Muslim world, and you see the Muslims going to kill, coming into Muslim places from other places to kill other Muslims. Why don't they go kill Zionists? Why aren't they going to Israel to help the Palestinians? No, they're going to kill other Muslims. And all the bombings in Iraq and everywhere else are to kill Muslims by Muslims. In Mexico, this is a wonderful question. Sister, the United States government is the greatest troublemaker on earth. And the Mexican cartel will never be able to use their money to help develop Mexico like they were. <coughs> like the Colombians was taking all that American money and it invested in an industry and everything else Pretty soon, Colombia would come up. They want to make sure it don't get used. That's why they have money managers, and the government of America can go and find exactly what bank and what system all of the money has been washed. Why? Because they're washing the money for you. When I became big, they had one of my friends. He became big also, and they wanted us to kill each other. Instead, I went to his house early in the morning. We out partying all night. I went to his house early in the morning, knocked on the door. He came out with his eyes big. Well, what you want? I said, uh, well, I want to talk to you a while. He says, uh, the people said, you said such and such. I said, that's why I came here. Somebody said, I said, so I'm here to tell you what I said myself. 
What was that? That was the government. The government was backing him and the government was backing me. But they want each, me and him to kill each other off. Then they bring another guy and raise him up. Then they'll have his best friend or his cousin kill him. They do it all the time. You think about the so-called drug dealers here. Think about the ones that was big 10 years ago. Where are they at now? Hmm? They're not going to be around long. They'll never get to use the money for anything beneficial, only for foolishness. And if they ever change to anything good, they'll be dead. Very, they'll sign in their own death warrant. You see, that's the exact process that I went through. That's why I had to leave the country. I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I quit. Oh, you're not going to quit, not on us. You can see that all Americans, African Americans know this story is true. The churches know it. We all know it because it happened to us so many times. The general American population don't know it. Are there any questions? Did I answer the question? Thank you for that question. That was a On behalf of IPCI, I would like to thank everyone, especially the Imam for this uh, interesting and inspiring session. I think we we all benefited from 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 his experiences and what we have this thing. I also like to thank some of our special guests. We have the chairman of the Juma Masjid uh, Trust, Mr. A. V. Muhammad, who has also attended. I'd like to thank all the brothers and the organizers of uh, Rove for taking the initiative and preparing all the. Uh, arrangement yesterday and also Thank today you. and also but to conclude the session we will conclude with the recitation of Surah Wal As. Awaz bin Nahimina Shaitan Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Wal As in the Linsan and the Fiqos, in the Lazina Aman who are in the Sali Had, but was so Bil Hak, but was so Bissal. Verily, by the token of time, man is at a loss except those who patiently persevere and put the trust in Allah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.